thank you very much for inviting me. And um, it's a pleasure to give a plenary talk at such a multidisciplinary conference. And um, basically, this talk covers topics that are related, but maybe not well, uh, focused on uh, hardware part, but they're more related to the AI and neuroscience part of the interest that hopefully kind of many of you are curious about. Uh, as to connection to hardware, that's rather a topic for open discussion. And if we have time, we might have a few minutes at the end. But let me first tell you a bit of a kind of background and story about what was happening in terms of various projects at this uh, exciting intersection of AI and neuroscience within IBM Watson, well, particularly Yorktown lab where I'm coming from. So the uh, virtuous cycle between AI and neuroscience has been going on for a long time. And you can view it as a bi-directional circle between applications of uh, various AI methods, machine learning, statistical analysis, to brain imaging data, and to various other neuroscience, health, psychology, psychiatry type of applications. While the more recent efforts include uh, trying to borrow ideas from neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, and so on, and bring them to AI. I mean, that's a, not a new idea, pretty much AI. What is not neuroscience inspired in it? But you can go very far from those inspirations and end up, well, with machine learning methods that may be much more limited than what brain can do. And you wonder, can you come back for more inspiration? And the universal kind of common goal between the communities, in a sense, is you try to understand the uh, nature and the laws governing intelligence, whether it's artificial or it's natural. So kind of distilling this common ground, this goal of both communities. Uh, this is very incomplete uh, kind of set of people who are working on this intersection. It mainly involves my collaborators, but the community at IBM is much larger, which is involved in different aspects of this intersection. And it also now includes not just Yorktown lab, but of course also newly formed um, IBM Cambridge lab, led by David Cox, and people in Almaden, and other labs as well. So let me just briefly start with uh, older, historically, and more established direction of application of AI to neuroscience and related uh, kind of fields. Uh, Why well, I'm starting with that, because it has, as I said, much longer history and much more has been done there. And uh, in a sense, it's more clear what to do. So basically, what people typically try to do when they use AI and bring it into, say, neuroimaging domain, they are looking for various so-called statistical biomarkers in the data. So basically, it's extracting or discovering features that could be predictive about particular disorders, say schizophrenia, or they can identify what in the brain is responsible for pain sensation, or what's the difference between functional networks of cocaine addicts and controls, and many questions like that. So the focus here, like what does it involve to apply AI to this type of um, studies, you take the data, for example, functional MRI or AEG or MAG, various modalities. But the idea is that when you build predictive AI model that can, say, classify control versus person with mental disorder, your focus is not on the predictive accuracy, like in machine learning. The focus shifts towards extracting predictive features or biomarkers, which can be anything from activities in particular area of the brain to how those regions interact in terms of functional network and so on. So this is just kind of a very brief overview of about a decade of work in the computational biology um, group in uh, Yorktown with my colleagues, trying to bring more machine learning into neuroimaging. And this feature extraction can be, as I said, done in various ways, starting from simple selection of most important voxels in the brain. They activate in response to pain, building sparse regression models like lasso and its extensions. You can go to a bit more sophisticated methods and try to engineer features 
knowing something about disorder, like, you know, schizophrenia is a network disorder. It's not a problem with particular area. So you start looking for network features, and voila, you find that with network features, you might be like 93% accurate discriminating schizophrenic patients from controls, while with just brain activations with response to task, not much you can say. So that's interesting. But then you ask yourself a question, that the question that the learning representations community and deep learning community was motivated by, uh, can I do this feature extraction automatically? Can I just discover those biomarkers without having to think hard what the features I should be constructing? And that's kind of the most recent line of work, and that's loosely based on deep, deep learning and any kind of hidden variable models and component analysis. So this is kind of just an overview slide. Well, over the course of years, uh, there are multiple successful applications of this type of methods to various uh, types of neuroimaging studies, starting from detecting what the person is doing in video game quite accurately, whether they are looking at a particular object or they are chasing someone, or whether they are feeling happy or anxious. Another work, as I mentioned, pain perception, it was quite surprising. You would think it's very subjective um, uh, notion of pain level. But from functional MRI, for each subject, for most of them, surprisingly, you can characterize the level of pain and kind of correlate with it quite highly, like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So it's, it was quite unexpected, especially given that fMRI is quite a noisy signal. Another study with colleagues from Mount Sinai showed that if you look at the functional MRI of people who suffer from cocaine addiction and compare them with controls, you can find very interesting and distinct biomarkers in their Markov net structure. So on and so forth. I mean, with uh, recurrent convolutional networks, you actually can uh, detect with high accuracy the level of cognitive load in, say, healthy people using EEG. With schizophrenia, as I already mentioned, depending on the data, depending on the group of subjects, uh, and depending on features you use, uh, you can get up to 93% accuracy of discriminating between the two cohorts. So on and so forth. And one last example along the AI for neuro or psychiatry side, I want to tell you because it's the most recent kind of work, then I would like to switch to the opposite direction. So one of the recent projects at this intersection was moving beyond brain imaging and towards more kind of easier to collect cheaper signals such as speech. And the motivation for that is among many that mental health could be definitely improved and there are just not enough uh, specialists who can really help all the potential patients. So I will not talk too much about the uh, extent of the problem, but some numbers speak for themselves. For example, just depression, it's, it's practically considered to be an epidemic in the uh, United States. And there are kind of scary predictions by the World Health Organization that by 2030, the amount of worldwide disability and life loss attributable to depression may become greater than for any other condition, including cancer, stroke, heart disease, and so on. So uh, I hope this prediction is a little bit overestimating what's going on, but uh, we get the idea. So bottom line is that having computation, having uh, automation or semi-automation helping patients uh, reach specialists, or at least serving as an intermediary between them, some kind of semi-automated therapy is a direction of research and kind of of practical importance. So there are multiple companies doing work in this area, but nothing really um, solves the problem sufficiently well. So there are systems which are kind of quite simplistic. Anyway, so I don't have much time to talk about that. There is a whole group in uh, Yorktown called Computational Psychiatry and Neuroimaging led by Guillermo Cecchi, and uh, we're collaborating. There are a bunch of papers about how to extract uh, statistical biomarkers from speech about certain mental disorders, and, well, obviously, language is window into the brain. But our most recent submitted paper uh, takes 
like a baby step in the direction of semi-automated therapist in the sense that we try to introduce model of the therapeutic dialogue and uh, build representations, learn representations that would kind of follow how the dialogue should go and try to align what patient and therapist have to say. Without giving too much technical details, I just want to say that this information gain kind of based representation learning uh, leads to dialogue generation, which seem to be much more meaningful to human evaluators, as measured by mechanical torque, than the baseline, well, state of the art, deep network systems for dialogue generation that we compared with. And here is one example where the patient says, well, I lost some weight since uh, last uh, uh, appointment. And therapist would say, yes, I mean, great, I noticed that. And the hashing methods are like three examples of flavors of our system. They say something reasonable, some more or less reasonable answers like, yes, I did. While, unfortunately, LSTM-based model could not learn from this data set. It was just too small, about 40,000 samples. And they require millions. And more advanced versions, um, so basically there was kind of a system that's supposed to be state of art from the University of Montreal and so on. They warned us in the beginning, you might not learn anything. You only have 40,000 samples. It's too small. So they kept repeating some nonsensical answers here. Well, apparently, deep learning is not a silver bullet in many applications, and that's one example. <laughs> that was just a funny other example. I, I'm not going to read through that, but patients complaining about how difficult it is to find therapists, how expensive they are, and so on and so on. And the therapists say, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, indeed, in our system, one of it was. And we didn't program that, but it just, oh, yeah, you never tried lithium. <laughs> we didn't program humor in that, but we should. Bottom line was to show that if you see what deep learning did, um, not much. Anyway, uh, I mean, it's not fair to blame deep learning system for not making sense. As we were warned, they didn't have enough data. But what I'm trying to say that if you use other methods with this data, you can generate something reasonable. Anyway, so this is um, uh, not the next year or next five year, but maybe next 20 year vision of semi-automation in that space. And ideally, you can approach this uh, kind of dialogue with a patient pretty much as a classical application of machine learning, where you collect the data, you extract features from everything you can get, and you try to build some model, perhaps dynamical, of this dialogue, and try to see if you can use relatively small amounts of data to generate something reasonable. Anyway, so that's kind of a vision, but let's go back to Earth and now talk about a few other current ongoing projects. So we talked about AI with applications to <coughs> psychiatry and neuroscience. And uh, after lots of kind of uh, efforts in this direction, the question was, well, can we now bring something from those domains and hopefully come up with better AI systems? And in what sense they should be better? That's a good question, too. We are not the first to ask this question. <laughs> I guess it's like a, uh, since birth of AI, people were asking those questions. But what specifically? I mean, McAuliffe and Pitt's model of a neuron is uh, quite an old model. Is there anything else we can do which would be more flexible? Or backpropagation algorithm has been in use for decades. But is it ideal way to learn? And so on and so forth. There are multiple questions you can ask about limitations of AI. And uh, looking at neuroscience proved useful because you have, well, deep learning, loosely, but still inspired by neuroscience. You have reinforcement learning. So you have good examples of successes, but there is so much not modeled yet. And uh, just to name a few things, plasticity in artificial systems is far behind obviously, plasticity in brains. And automation that was mentioned several times yesterday is far from being truly implemented there. I mean, there is lots of recent research in the AI community on how to do AutoML. Still, it's nothing close to how biology works and how brains develop from single cell following DNA program and how they develop from single cell in evolution over millions of years. 
attention is being modeled to some extent, but it's not exactly attention that's going on in our brains. Memory is important topic. Again, people try, but it's very far from true models of memory, what's going on right now in uh, deep networks. So on and so forth. And finally, the main point also touched upon yesterday in our discussions, if you look at artificial neural nets, they are motivated by kind of statistical thinking about having a data set, learning a model as a vector of parameters, converging to that fixed model, and then later on using it. That's nothing like biological brains work. So they are constantly changing, and activation never stops even if you don't provide any input. So it's clearly highly nonlinear, coupled, humongous, dynamical system. So bringing some of those uh, aspects into AI might give it extra capabilities, but the question is like, what capabilities and what do you bring? And spiking networks are one step in this direction, but there are so many ways to do spiking networks as well. So those are the questions, yeah. Because we need to go back and forth between limitations of AI that we would like to solve and what can we get from neuroscience? Because we cannot just ask the question what to get from neuroscience if we don't know what we are getting it for. Just to, oh, the <laughs> sequence is a little bit messed up. Just to give an extended list of various, uh, various aspects where AI is far behind the uh, biological brains, you can just name a few. So in deep learning, as I mentioned, mainly ad hoc engineering of networks with some elements of automated uh, construction, nothing like that in the brain. Catastrophic forgetting in lifelong, le lifelong learning, although addressed in recent uh, various papers, is still a problem. How do you adapt without forgetting when the number of tasks is pretty much infinite during lifetime? Um, we seem to be able to handle it. Uh, what can we bring? from neuroscience to AI, so on and so forth. About the huge amounts of data, I just gave you an example. Few short learning in our brains, or at least learning from less than a million examples is a norm. Uh, stability, robustness in various senses, we all know uh, it's a popular area, adversarial <coughs> neural nets, uh, where you disturb the input slightly, you cannot see the difference in the images, but it completely throws off the network from the ground and the network misclassifies greatly. Same thing in terms of parameters. Uh, neural nets usually highly sensitive to their hyperparameters and that's why in practice it requires tons of tweaking before you get performance you want. Again, so robustness is seem to be a stronger um, kind of um, property of uh, biological brains as compared to artificial ones. So on and so forth and uh, not even mentioning massive amounts of power versus the amount of power required to this network to work. <laughs> the differences go on and go on. So those are like functional um, gaps. Um, those differences are more like how things are different in terms of implementation, which may or may not be necessary uh, stuff to borrow, but it's something at least to look at. In terms of real valued propagation in neural nets, versus spikes. In terms of non-local floating precision, back propagation going uh, through all the layers sequentially versus asynchronous updates locally, and so on and so forth. So we also mentioned single and multiple time scales in yesterday discussions and in many other discussions before. So neuroscientists come, keep coming back to the importance of incorporating multiple time scales while Typically, neural net doesn't operate this way. The list goes on and on, and uh, personally to me, the last point that I already mentioned before seems to be most crucial. So brain is not a fixed model with parameters that it learned over a fixed data set. That's pretty much it. And dynamics in the brain is non-equilibrium. I guess you're at equilibrium when you're dead, but not when you're alive. So 
So there is quite a gap. I think it's kind of more than enough to convince us that AI has a lot to learn from neuroscience. But as I mentioned, how do you know what to tease out from a huge, like totally, like a vast ocean area of neuroscience knowledge, which also varies from levels of cellular neuroscience to system neuroscience to cognitive, and just those sub areas on themselves are separate vast oceans with certain intersections. So neuroscience is actually not even like in the state of physics with clearly defined laws and so on. So by itself, it's a big mess. Now, you ask what to tease out to improve intelligence. At that level, it's very hard to answer this question. So I suggest you can think about that as information bottleneck, like uh, Tali Tishby proposed a long time ago. If you have a high dimensional input X of neuroscience knowledge, in order to compress it into something quote unquote useful, like model M, you need to know what your target problem is. So if you identify a particular AI challenge, be it lifelong learning, automated machine learning, efficiency in terms of number of samples, reinforcement learning, more bio-inspired, language understanding, and so on, for that specific problem, you might need to um, kind of tease out or compress out particular aspects of neuroscience. But it's still an open question. I mean, I try to write an algorithm for doing interdis interdisciplinary science here. So yeah, it's, it's still at the level of pseudocode. <laughs> but we're getting there. So that's the last slide on the long-term high-level goals. And I'll go to specific examples. So as I mentioned, you want to really model plasticity, attention, memory, more biologically plausible reward processing than in relatively simple reinforcement learning models. And you want to view your artificial system, hopefully just like a biological one, as non-equilibrium, stochastic, dynamical system. But that's kind of, a, again, a long-term goal. And uh, yeah, with the order being out of order, that's roughly the current focus of several projects uh, that we're working on addressing particular challenges in AI. So the challenge of trying to get, well, not too far in the future, but to improve somewhat learning algorithms and neuronal models, that uh, beyond backpropagation type of studies of algorithms, which are done both at IBM and outside of IBM. It's a topic of current excitement. There was a Hinton's paper at NIPS evaluating different um, non-propagation, non backpropagation based models. Yosho Benji works on that, equilibrium propagation, so on. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute in details. And another topic is this automation of AI using plasticity. And also the real time kind of behavior. Neuromorphic hardware is no, um, basically a topic of projects across IBM research, including Almaden and Yorktown. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that right now unfortunately, because I tried to cover the first two topics. But uh, yeah, so that uh, dialogue generation I kind of mentioned. But again, it's not the topic of today work, uh, today talk. Let's start with a simple step, not too far from the current state of art in AI, and ask ourselves a question about maybe better neuronal models and better algorithms. In a sense, if you think about the history of AI, uh, and backtrack in that history and ask yourself a question, what if a McAuliffe and Pitts model would be replaced by something more sophisticated? And then when it was uh, time to, for backpropagation to kind of start ruling the world, what if different algorithms were developed? What would have happened? So you can ask all kind of questions about backtracking and history tree, but some of them are being currently explored, and actually been explored for a while, such as different neuronal models. Uh, people are exploring uh, more uh, kind of more specific segregated dendrite models. There are a few papers at NIPS, again, Yoshua Benjo group and so on. There is work going on within IBM, New Yorktown. Capsule networks of Hinton are somewhat in that direction too. Next question is beyond backpropagation more biologically plausible and hopefully more efficient algorithms. That's a 
hot topic in at least sub area of deep learning because historically Jan Lecan proposed target propagation long time ago in his thesis, like in 80s, 86. But it never really worked as well as back propagation. So they kind of gave up on that. And more recently, Yoshio Benjo tried to do the difference target propagation. They had a CML paper 2015. And recently, Hinton evaluated uh, different flavors of target propagation presented at NIPS. But the conclusion so far was it does not really work as well as back propagation. So people keep trying. <laughs> because it feels that backpropagation has issues that could be improved, and using biological plausibility might be the key. So what's wrong with backpropagation? So biological implausibility is one interesting notion, and classical complaints are that you do not model neural activity. Your propagation only involves synaptic weights, and neural activity is deterministic because uh, the neural net is pretty much a deterministic uh, function computation. So that's kind of not right. Weight transport problem, that kind of the connections on the forward and backward paths have to be the same. And many other things about precise clocking between both passes and so on and so on. But for AI folks, what is even more important is not just biological plausibility, but computational issues. So the vanishing gradient problem is still there. There are many approaches in different settings, like LSTMs and so on. But vanishing gradients still could happen if the networks are very deep or it's a recurrent network. And it's all due to the chain of derivatives being um, kind of the core of the algorithm. Uh, Non-differentiable non-linearities, like uh, binary activation, is not always handled well. I mean, backpropagation, by definition, cannot handle them. You have to do something else and so on and so forth, including computationally the issue that you cannot even parallelize computation across the layers. It's inherently sequential. Anyway, as I mentioned, the alternatives such as target propagation has been tried before by, uh, by the recipients of the Turing Award, as we kind of learned yesterday. But unfortunately, there is still room for improvement. They are more biologically plausible, but they don't work as well. So we kind of trying to add our two cents to this subfield. Uh, and there is an increasing number of so-called auxiliary variable methods uh, trying optimization that's based on explicit weight updates and activation updates. So basically, you introduce activations as a noisy explicit variables, and you alternatingly minimize objective function. You can easily incorporate sparsity constraints and so on in this formulation. Uh, we have papers submitted. Results are promising. So at least we haven't seen yet target propagation to outperform uh, stochastic gradient descent and, well, say, Adam version of that on almost anything. Those are specific architectures. Some are fully connected. Uh, there is one RNN. There is a convolutional LENET5. Uh, there are just a few examples and a few data sets like MNIST, CIFAR-10, and sequential, sequential MNIST. But we are seeing some promising results in the sense that our approach seems to be, first of all, converging faster. It kind of learns faster. And then it's pretty much on par with uh, backpropagation SGD. But it has those advantages that, by definition, it breaks the chain of gradients. You should not have vanishing gradients there. You might have some other problems, perhaps. You can parallelize it across layers. And since it's, since it's local optimization, you can more easily incorporate whatever nonlinearities you want. Again, it's not silver bullet, but it's nice that there are some promising results. OK, so that was a quick story about trying to improve learning algorithms. Another aspect where we want to improve AI, as I mentioned, is plasticity, adaptation. And you can think about that at different scales. You can think about plasticity in terms of architectural changes. You have a living organism with a particular network, but over the course of lifetime, the organism adapts and network changes. So it's kind of online architecture adaptation, uh, which relates to adult neurogenesis. Another type of changes are more like short term which part of the network you choose to perform certain function, 
which part of the input you choose to focus on. So this is more like attention. Uh, I focus more on neurogenesis for now with attention, I'll only show one slide, but there are many interesting topics <laughs> within plasticity. So this was uh, work from several years ago, published at HKI 2017, where we just try to come up with a very simplistic model of the adult neurogenesis process, and definitely Brad is much more qualified to talk about adult neurogenesis in this room. That's why the disclaimer is this was a machine learning AI people approach to coming up with a very simple answer to a neuroscientist question. The colleague neuroscientist asked, given all the literature on adult neurogenesis, with various experimental kind of results. What can you say about why it's needed? Can you come up with simplistic model uh, showing that it's needed in certain situations? And situation seems to be from, again, existing literature, when the rat is exposed to a changing environment, rich learning environment, supposedly more neurons develop in the gy gyrus of hippocampus where your kind of memories are quickly formed. If there is not much out there, well, I guess use it or lose it, the neurons are born, but they don't survive, so there is more death. Very, very loosely speaking, you can think about some simple representation learning model, and we will just be, in this case, doing autoencoder or dictionary learning. You learn online, and you see what happens if you show changing environments versus same environment, and also changing network versus fixed size network of the same size. So basically, can you explain the observations in neuroscience to some extent, and can you at the same time come up with a better algorithm for learning representations if the environment changes? Again, our two cents, very simple model, just classical sparse coding, but in online setting, or dictionary learning in online setting, where you encode input X into hid one hidden layer, and you optimize it uh, in terms of uh, approximation or representation error. So it's kind of autoencoder that tries to predict what the input should have been from that compressed representation from that. Uh, yeah. Again, without going too much into detail, this is essentially one hidden layer autoencoder or dictionary learner. You can formulate it as a classical sparse coding. You try to optimize your reconstruction error while you also requiring uh, the activity to be sparse. And you can introduce sparsity over connectivity. The crucial part was introducing sparsity or group sparsity, the last term, which enforces uh, sparsity across nodes. So essentially, if you uh, require all the incoming connections of the neuron to be deleted if they are not contributing jointly, then essentially neuron is deleted. So that's how we implement deaths in this network, while births is adding random neurons. I know from yesterday discussions, it's totally wrong way to do in real brain, and the connections probably do not go to all the other inputs, and they are quite selective. But again, as I said, it's very computational model underscoring computational here. Somewhat inspired by adult neurogenesis phenomenon. Well, bottom line is that, yes, after enough tweaking of those models, just like with everything in AI, you actually observe the behavior that uh, makes sense. If you show the system that allowed to expand and compress uh, hidden neurons, you show it different environments. In this case, we use different uh, imaging data sets. Uh, different, again, that's a separate discussion how you measure that and so on. Um, this case were images of the city versus images of nature. But of course, as I said, I mean, it, it, it's not formally defined yet like how different the difference should be. What we observed, the curves here were showing that the neurogenetic model which was expanding and compressing over time and reaching certain state, uh, the blue line, at a particular um, size it would reach, models better, represents better new data and old data. So basically, if you allow model to reach certain size 
by neurogenetic process, birth and death, versus just fixing the size of the model from the beginning and trying to train it in this uh, kind of continual learning setting, switching between different domains. So far, what we've seen is that the adaptive neurogenetic model does better, not just in terms of adaptation, but also in terms of not forgetting. Again, the disclaimer is uh, it's somewhat limited set of experiments and particular architectures. But it's promising, and in a sense, for neuroscience, it supports your observations. For machine learning people, it gives them a bit more flexible model to learn in continual learning setting. OK, so I probably, um, how much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes to 9, so. OK, so OK. Yeah, I know. I, I realized that I should have done quite a bit of compression on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I will probably just briefly mention another project related to attention. Uh, there is lots of work in machine learning literature on various forms of attention. And typically, well, attention takes form of sparsity or approximate sparsity, where essentially you select subset of inputs in an image uh, loosely motivated by foveation in the human brain, when the eye focuses on certain small area of the image and decides where to focus in order to do well. Because, I mean, the whole notion of attention is to very quickly do kind of compressed sensing of the environment to reach certain goal. There is lots of literature by uh, Yael Neve and uh, other people working on reinforcement learning and attention about how attention is driven by reward, well, and reward is driven by attention. We're trying to do certain modeling along those lines. We had a paper at HKI 2017 on context-attentive bandit. So bandits are a particular kind of simplified version, I would say, of reinforcement learning, basically online decision-making in the unlimited set of possible features. So you don't, even, you don't necessarily have like a fixed feature vector like machine learning assumes. And you don't have values of that, but you need to learn to decide where to look in order to maximize your reward. So that's kind of environment where you will be getting reward, not just for decision you make, but also for where you looked across features. You can think not just about imaging. You can think about huge number of possible medical tests to run on a patient, and you having to decide which set of three tests to do first to diagnose the patient quickly and provide this appropriate treatment. So I mean, it's a generic setting where the input number of features is huge or unlimited, too costly to measure, and you don't have that feature vector. It's a bit different from deep learning formulations where you have it, but you select subset. Here you have to learn where to look. Anyway, so it's all uh, on archive. And those papers are, as I said, uh, published. Some other papers which are not published are also on archive. So, but basically, everything I talk about here is on archive. So finally, I just wanted to um, talk a bit about the project which tries to model the nonlinear dynamics of the brain while also hoping to provide maybe a better uh, dynamical modeling method in general for kind of any type of data. So it started with the motivation of trying to capture brain dynamics from calcium imaging data. And the data set, well, one of them, we have several now, was a, uh, I think by now very famous uh, larval zebrafish data set, which you can actually see on YouTube. Um, calcium imaging is quite amazing in the sense of time and space resolution as compared to EEG or fMRI. EEG has time resolution, but bad space resolution, fMRI is vice versa. Calcium has it both, but you cannot do it on humans. Anyway, there is no perfect solution, but at this high sp spatial temporal resolution with this transparent fish, you can truly see that like one voxel in fMRI includes about a yeah, million of neurons. Here, each neuron is covered by several voxels. So it's very, very detailed type of data about the live brain. So yeah, so that kind of was movie showing the activity there. 
And uh, it's not always just following your nice analytical model, because sometimes there are some events that are definitely hard to model. It was kind of some, yeah. <laughs> so this kind of epileptic seizure in the larval fish, we don't know what it was, and it was definitely not captured by one, say, wonderful model, some kind of phase transition. Or I, I don't know what was going on, and it's better to talk to neuroscientists. But what we try to model, the periods when uh, at least it's possible to capture and predict <laughs> dynamics, uh, Again, without going too much detail, everything on an archive, you can try to fit Van der Poel oscillator. Um, been in the literature, why Van der Poel and so on, uh, there are some reasons to think that it's going to be an appropriate model. You fit it to this data, x1 is observations, but it's very non-trivial problem just to fit it from scratch, not knowing initial conditions, so after tweaking it for a bit and trying combination with stochastic search and so on, you find a model that can really fit this data well and several other data sets, like up to like 0 0.8 correlation with actual uh, kind of activity, although in SVD space. The good thing about this model, unlike DeepNet, is it's interpretable because you can see in the um, W matrix how different brain areas affect each other. But if you try to predict with this model, it was not ideal, so we did need to combine it with deep learning. Bottom line, his, here was a recipe. You may have some good idea about analytical model, but not enough data, like 500 times series. Again, that's the case where deep learning is not particularly strong. You use it as simulator, pre-train, and then your LSTM works much better in terms of forecasting time series because it's combined that prior knowledge that brain is supposed to be a nonlinear dynamical system. And actually, I'm done, and that's my last slide, just to try and organize mentally different efforts going on within IBM along the lines of cellular systems cognitive neuroscience and how they map to different aspects of neuroscience inspired AI and people behind that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Irina, for a fascinating tour. So the floor is open for questions. Yeah, um, thank you for your great insight. Um, I also strongly agree with you that there is a gap that exists between neuroscience and AI, and it is a very, very big gap. And so my question for you is a very opinionated sort of high-level question, and that question is, sort of given that you spend both times now in both worlds, the neuroscience world and the machine learning world, what is the most, the single most important thing that you've learned, you know, in your studies or in your research that sort of will help us make progress and I sort of define progress as, you know, making this bridge stronger. Okay, so um, again, the high level question requires a high level answer. So that's fair. <laughs> I, I would say I think it's a key to uh, try as much as possible to have people talk to each other from different communities. So basically, uh, AI community, machine learning community, sometimes may be quite far from neuroscience, and they basically like live in their own world. Well, I mean, every community has its property. That's why I think interdisciplinary workshops and conferences and really trying to encourage interdisciplinary research like seriously is one answer to that, because otherwise people just totally live in uh, parallel realities. And uh, people at NIPS, like stu young students are asking a neuroscientist presenting uh, plenary, why are you talking about all this diversity? We know that brain runs one algorithm, right? And they, they mean it. <laughs> so this was scary, that's why. <laughs> okay, so this is one thing, I think, uh, workshops and so on, but um, Perhaps like we talked yesterday, benchmarks. So basically benchmarks or problems kind of showing AI uh, that there are certain problems and some data and so on that, I mean, you guys cannot solve well, and it's not ImageNet. 
So just in case. So I think it should come both from AI field, because they're searching for extensions and for what they cannot do, now, but it also can come from other disciplines. So basically, from hardware community, I didn't even get to talk to that, what would be useful for AI. We had it, a new AI workshop in September in the IBM when uh, our neuromorphic computing folks like Welford presented constraints that, say, neuromorphic hardware imposes on those algorithms. So that's important to know. For example, if you know that in hardware, say, uh, memristors cannot update your weights symmetrically, there will be this drift. You may need to think about different algorithm, not back propagation, maybe not alternating minimization, something that could satisfy those constraints. So I think AI could greatly benefit from realistic constraints coming from both neuroscience and from physics in hardware. They're totally unaware of that, and that that's OK if they're going to stay with that hardware. But if not, they need to know constraints before developing algorithms. I think that would be useful. Uh, okay, so w what exactly, so we talked a lot about what AI can learn from neuroscience, but what about the inverse? What can neuroscience learn from AI? That's a good question. I didn't really actually touch that part. I mentioned how neuroscience can use AI to answer its questions. Uh, it's not what to learn. Okay, there is a separate lines of research uh, going on and uh, Jim DiCarlo and work like that where you're basically trying to uh, use deep networks to study visual cortex rather than vice versa. Uh, it's, it's a topic for a separate conversation, and I'd be happy to um, discuss it offline, because I see that uh, you're getting a little bit anxious. No, it's still in 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think what neuroscience could learn from AI, maybe one example, neurogenesis is very simplistic, but like you come up with computational model and demonstrates advantages in certain situations like in some sense changing environment, and it may or may not correspond to what's going on. But basically this overly simplified, but hopefully capturing the gist of the situation model may be used for simulating and then comparing if that's really what's going on in reality. Then if it does, you can say that to some extent you understood something about um, kind of neuroscience and about the real processes. So it, it provides wrong, but hopefully useful models. Maybe some of them can give you this understanding. Yeah. But again, it's, it, it's a separate topic for a separate workshop. <laughs> I have one quick question. When you mentioned the terms neurogenesis, did you also include the formation of synapses between existing neurons in that term? Uh, in this work, we didn't do that. but. You should be. So this was uh, adult neurogenesis as a birth of cells, mm -hmm. of neurons. Yeah, I didn't go into detail and so on. There is much on that. And uh, basically, they're born at a certain rate, and some survive, some don't, depending on condition and so on. Well, growth of synaptic connections is, of course, part of it. Mm -hmm. And right now, as I said, it's very overly simplistically modeled as, OK, you added a neuron with random connections. So in a sense, it was done together. So when you add neuron, you add connections. But you can also just not just prune connections like we do with sparsity, but you can add them. Yeah. Good. There no reason not to do that. We just didn't do it okay. yet. Well, okay. Very good. Thank you. Let's thank you again.